Okay, so we have been doing a series this summer on the Holy Spirit. And last week, Ryan was teaching us about the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to the church. For its building up, for its strengthening, for its health. And he drew our attention to 1 Corinthians 12. There are a number of passages, as he said, that you could look at that talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And those different, there's lists sort of, and not all lists are exactly the same that are in the scriptures. But he drew our attention to 1 Corinthians 12. And just to remind you, he told us that the best way to explore what your gifts might be were to, to, to be serving. Because it's as you serve and you you know, as you explore, what was going on there? How did that go? Why do I think it maybe went that way? Pray with others, talk with others about that. Um, and you come to notice maybe things other people might say to you, wow, I really notice you really have a real way of encouragement with others, right? Pay attention to that. So, um, but now today, uh, we're going to look at two different passages, and one of them is 1 Corinthians 13, the very next chapter. And uh, Paul has taught that these gifts that the Holy Spirit gives are amazing, necessary. They're not the same as our natural talents. They might involve our natural talents, but they're not the same as our natural talents. But in 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul goes on to teach that even given all these wonderful gifts, that what is preeminent is, in 1 Corinthians 13, what is most excellent is what? Love. Love. And, of course, um, this is a familiar passage to many people. It's often read aloud in all kinds of contexts. Jesus himself, of course, said that there is no greater commandment than to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And who was our neighbor? Anyone. Anyone. What is genuine love? I was getting my hair cut this week. They did a good job, eh? Her name's Jenny Razor's Edge. Okay, so anyway... Um, but, uh, I was talking to her and she says, so what have you been doing this week? I said, well, I'm getting a sermon ready. Oh, wow. What's that like? And I told her that it's about genuine love. And she said, what is genuine love? Right? Isn't that, isn't that a great question? What is genuine love? I do not mean romantic love, although a genuine love can occur within romantic love. I want you to take a moment and think about someone you know who has been really loving to you. It might be a teacher that you've had. It might be a parent that you've had. It might be a sibling. It might be a friend. It might be a neighbor. It might be a coworker. I want you to just think for a minute about someone you can remember who you felt really loved by. I hope that you can remember someone who has treated you that way. It is refreshing. It is very warm. Paul describes what it looks like at 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 4, love is patient. I know this is familiar. That's okay. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. 
Love never fails. As beautiful as this passage is, it's kind of difficult to carry out, right? You don't have to get very far through that list to go, ah. <laughs> difficult to do with any consistency. We need the Holy Spirit to form inside of us a loving heart. And the Lord is our vision. He models true love to us. He lays down his very life for the sake of love. Not, oh, well, I guess so. I guess I ought to. Not obeying his father because he should, but because he wants to. He's willing to. One must ask whether the church can really say, be said to be the church if love is not evident. There's other things that should be present, truth. <laughs> but what if love is not evident? A church where people do not love each other well has nothing to offer the world. Nothing. Let me share a letter with you. And if you can put up that slide for me. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon. By the way, Philemon means lover of strength and courage. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, and also Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to pause there for a second. You just go back once. Can, can you do that? Go back one. Thanks. So, <clears throat> notice it's to the church that meets in our home, your home. And I just want to make an aside, which I think I perhaps I've said at other times, is that when you read each of Paul's letters, you will notice you should notice who is the heading. Who is this addressed to? And it says, usually, the church in Colossae, the church in Galatia. That means that every time you read you in the passage, it's not singular. It includes me and you and them individually, but it's to a body. In this case is a bit of an exception, because although this may have unlikely, very likely been read to the whole congregation, the style of this beginning is like the style of personal letters of that time. So, very personal letter. So, it is primarily written to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. Okay, great. Next slide. Thank you. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me, that's Paul, great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. By the way, I just want to mention, draw your attention to, because he said at the beginning, I'm a prisoner for Christ. He's probably in Ephesus, about 200 kilometers from where, probably from where Philemon is in the Coloss Colossae area. So he's a prisoner. He's writing from some kind of cell containment area. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Notice, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none 
other than Paul, an old man now and also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. It's about 55 AD CE. An old man now and also a prisoner of Christ that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. A name, by the way, which means useful. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, a little pun of Paul's there, but now he has become useful, as his name means, to both you and me. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, come back to that, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. I just want to mention that the reason that we know that this is probably in the Colossae area is because the same, well, and who is with Paul? Paul, this book is, Philemon is written probably right about the same time as the book Colossians is written. So it's interesting to kind of read them together. And the reason that that is known is because you can see who is sending their greetings. Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, exactly the same list at the end of the book of Colossians. Okay? Okay, so the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that is the whole book of Philemon, just a little letter. Okay. So, an honest master is being asked to take back a worker, a slave specifically, we'll come back to that, who ripped him off and went on the lamp. And Paul is promising to cover anything owing to Philemon. Phil, I'll call him Phil. Any damage, any debt, he says, I'll cover whatever it is. He doesn't even know. It's like, here's my visa number. Next, Paul is not asking Philemon to have pity on Onesimus and make him the object of some good deed. Oh no, he says, now he's your dear brother, just as he's become dear to me. Well, let's look at at these individual characters a little bit. So Paul is in prison. So there must have been some system of being visited by people when you're in prison. I, this is not the same as Rome where he's on house arrest. There's reason to think that he's actually in a prison setting. But people must be able to come and see him and fetch things for him. Maybe they have to bring him food. And so somebody has brought, has found this slave who's a runaway, who is a runaway from somebody they know back in the church. I know you're thinking, what is, why are there slaves? Why is anybody from the church having slaves? We're going to come back to that. 
But somehow, this guy Onesimus has been met up with, maybe in the marketplace, in <clears throat> uh, probably Ephesus, so maybe around 200 kilometers where he's supposed to be, and he's been brought to Paul to meet Paul. And Paul says, he's my son. What is he talking about? He means he's his son in the faith. The implication of that is that he led him to faith in Jesus. So Paul took this man who has acted like a scoundrel, has acted like a scoundrel, and he has led him to faith in Jesus. And he's gone further than that. He didn't just lead him to faith in Jesus and now he's done. He's discipling him. He has an ongoing relationship with him. He says he's become very dear with him to him and very useful and helpful, beneficial to him. He's talking about in the work of the gospel and in Paul's personal support. Because Paul's really supporting the churches from a distance. Now let's look at Onesimus. Okay, so he's done a really bad thing. I don't know if he, we don't know if he was sorry for this bad thing he's done and just scared to return even before he, be, he came to Christ. But now he has come to Christ, so he would be, my life needs to be brought back into order. I have done some things that are wrong. And Paul, who is the leader of this movement of the church to the Gentiles, has personally led him to the Lord, taken him under his wing, and treated him that he is very dear you, I hope you know what it's like to feel that you are very dear to somebody. That's why I asked you to think about, do you remember somebody who's really loved you well? Isn't it lovely to be treated dearly? And so Onesimus is going to go back. He's got to make things right. He's got to return. He doesn't have the means to pay. Perhaps he's used up anything he's stolen. He doesn't have the means to make restitution, but Paul's going to cover it for him, humbling. And he's got to go back and face him and hope that he'll be gracious to him. And Philemon, what kind of a position is he in? Well, he needs to be forgiving. Paul's asking him to. He needs to welcome Onesimus. That's what love looks like. Be devoted to him, forgive him, welcome him. I put brackets here. If you are being physically or really emotionally abused by someone, welcoming them back is not the pathway that you need. So you should talk to a counselor or a pastor about that and get some wisdom. So brackets there, okay? However, generally speaking, forgive him, yes, welcome him. Be devoted to him, says Paul. Now, Paul is a very accomplished person. He's been rejected by his fellow Jews because he's become a Christian, but he was a very, very accomplished Jew. He's very well-educated. And who is he befriended? A slave, bottom tier. He doesn't have the elegance of Paul. He doesn't have the sophistication of Paul. But Paul already knows what it's like to be cast out. He's in prison now. And that's all a level playing ground in God's kingdom. It's all a level playing ground. Galatians and uh, Colossians, Paul says in both, uh, that uh, all are one in Christ. There is no slave or free, male or female, uh, Greek or Jew, all, Gentile or Jew, all are, sl are one, one in Christ, level ground. Okay. So this is like a little mini picture, an example of what this big, lofty, genuine love looks like in practice in a situation 2,000 years ago. 
But as I mentioned a few times, and the alert reader would have noticed, what's with the slavery thing? So, it's like an elephant tromping through between the lines of the story. Why is he sending a slave back to his master? Shouldn't he be saying, I'm going to help you get free? I'm going to pay, pay, pay off your, the equivalent, your value, so you're a free gun. How come he's not uh, leading a, a, some kind of an uprising against slavery in the Roman world? Have you ever wondered that? Why are there slaves still? Is the church supportive of slaves? This is not the main thread of the story and the theme today, but you can't ignore it because it's important. Does this mean slavery is cool with God? Well, a little bit of background. Keeping slaves in the Roman world, not just the Roman world, long before the Roman world, throughout the world, but in the Roman world, was very common. In some areas, one out of five people were slaves. That was kind of uh, a high rate of slavery, probably in the area that is Italy. But in the general area, including Asia Minor, probably about one in 10 people were slaves. They would have been born into slavery but slavery wouldn't have been their whole life story. So there's some things when we think of slavery, I'm not saying slavery is okay, but when we think of slavery, we're thinking of the US and slavery of, of, of black people captured from Africa, kidnapping essentially, right? And, except there was no ransom, and, and life enslavement, and, and beating and abuse, right? We're thinking of that picture, and I just want to say that the... the um, it's not the same as the, institu the, the institution of slavery as we're more familiar with. So keeping slaves was extremely common. It was normative. It was considered a normal aspect of social life and the economy. It was not a preferable station in life, but it was not considered immoral to have somebody as a slave. And slaves in the Roman world were not regarded as inhuman. They were not regarded as inhuman. Many people were free to do work often, did work on the side so that they could earn money in their, in their, on their own time to uh, buy their own slavery and become free. So it was like, kind of like a stepping stone. Um, it's not the same, but if you ever... Um, think back on maybe the first job you ever had, whether it was stacking hay bales or whether it was trying to keep up with all the orders in a fast food joint. Like, you may think of it as, I'm not going to be here forever, it's okay. <laughs> all right? So it was a stepping stone for many people. They expected not to stay in that situation. If you had a good master to boot, and it was in the master's interests to do this, then you had shelter, you had food, you had protection, and you were trained to do useful things. Now you might say, yeah, but you were still a slave. Except that if you weren't a slave and you were very, very poor, your condition would probably be much worse at that time. So, why, what reasons would there be for Paul not standing against this? And Jesus gave stories, uh, parables, talking about masters and slaves, and did not say, you should not have slaves. <laughs> I'm not saying, go out and get a slave. That's not what I'm saying. But Paul himself is currently in jail for Christ, he has no standing to change anything. Christians are being profoundly persecuted. It's only within about eight or nine years that Nero is going to run them, round them up by the wagon load and have them fed to the lions. They do not have standing. They do not have social capital. And like I said, the condition of a person 
suddenly free without means or ability is in big trouble. So they actually are, their, their basic well-being is um, much better than it might otherwise be. Paul knows Jesus changes hearts. If you have ever looked at social conditions around you and said, oh my goodness, we need to change all of this, and you try to think how to do it, and you work for it, and you work for it, and maybe you work for it for years, and then you still say, but it's not changing. You know that change happens one heart at a time. God is very interested in changing us from the inside out. Your brother and sister in Christ are just that. They are your brother and sister in Christ. You are one in God's eyes, and that's what he expects from us, to treat each other really, really well with love. Onesimus was a man who, because of his betrayal, was owed nothing culturally speaking. You probably know somebody in your life who you think deserves nothing. Paul reminds Philemon that he didn't deserve anything either. And Paul himself says, I was once a violent, persecuting man. It's all grace. They were all pursued and welcomed and loved by God to come in the front door of the kingdom of God for all who would believe in him. Not to skulk around in the alley and worm your way in the back door. That's an image from an author named Dennis Lennon. But come on in the front door. There's a place set for you. Everyone. Just remembered I forgot to do the offering. If you can give me a wave at the end. Come. We did it? We did it. Okay, well, great job. <laughs> then I would have said, I hope you feel no pressure to give. It is for those who call our church home. That's funny, eh? Okay. We need the Holy Spirit to form inside of us a loving heart. I said that when I read that list from 1 Corinthians that it is very beautiful to read and extremely difficult to do. About a month ago, I was teaching about um, how God forms us to be like him. And do you remember that little video that I showed about the woman locked inside the bathtub trying to clean with the vim? Okay, the reason I showed you the little video is because it's for VIM, and VIM is an acronym that I wanted to, you to remember, I've remembered it at least, which is vision, intention, means. How do you change? You need vision, you need intention, and you need means. That applies to anybody in the world, but our means, wow, and our vision, wow. Recently, I had a circumstance my poor husband, when he has to live through these times with me, um, but he, he does, appreciate it. Um, when I needed love that I did not have, and inside of me built more and more and more tension because I knew I needed love and I didn't have it, and I held on to my lack of love and I was struggling. I needed to spend time on vision, looking at who Jesus is, but that wouldn't be enough. I needed intention, and I needed means. Whoa, I have the Holy Spirit. Why wasn't I relying on the Holy Spirit? Because I didn't have a full intention. Didn't have a full intention. I had, to kind of, I had to kind of back myself into a corner till I was so frustrated. I just said, God, why are you doing this to me? which, of course, I know he's not. You know what I'm saying? That's how we feel, right? That's how we feel when the pressure's on and we have to be some way that we don't feel like being. 
and I got kind of to the end of my rope, and then I said to the Lord, I mean, I was at the end of my rope. I was stressed out and frustrated because I didn't want to let go and love. And then I was able to say honestly the prayer, Lord, give me a loving heart. <laughs> and this doesn't always happen this way. He'll work somehow when you give him a genuine, when you have genuine intention with God. But immediately he filled my heart with love. Immediately I felt a warmth. I felt this, this, this soothing. And I began to actually feel what I needed. That's the Holy Spirit. He can do that. He can do that for you. And he'll do it in whatever way pleases him. There's another slide there. Genuine love refreshes the heart. Genuine love is deeply refreshing. Let's be people who give genuine love. Let's refresh one another. Let's be refreshing a sign to the world of refreshment. Because the Holy Spirit wants to create a church that is marked by the love of Jesus. That requires, of course, that we not be attentive to the specks in the eyes of others, but in the logs of our own eye. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13 again, but in the form of a prayer. Um, so I'm going to kind of speak it back to God. We're going to kind of do that together. And... Uh, he has the power. He has the power that we need to make us more and more like his son. Let's pray together. Our dear, dear Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you say that if we speak in the tongues of men or of angels but don't have love, that we are only resounding gongs or clanging cymbals. You say that if we have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge but, and have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, we are nothing. That's what you say. You say that if we give all we have to the poor and we give ourselves over to hardship that we could boast but we don't have love, we have gained nothing. That's what you say. And your love that you are offering to form in us is patient and kind and not envious and not boastful and not proud. And your love does not dishonor others and it is not self-seeking and it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Your love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. Your love, Lord, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. It is so beautiful, Lord. Your love never fails. We ask you, our Father, to have mercy on us, to cleanse us, and to make us each day more like you. Because of the love of Jesus, we pray together. Amen.